Hello. Uh, thank you for coming back uh, to uh, my class and our study of uh, Romans. Uh, today we're going to be in uh, chapter 6, uh, verses 7 through 11. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, take you back. I know that we've had a hard week uh, this week with uh, all the elections and, and stuff that's going on with that stuff. Uh, and then regardless of wherever you're at, where, however you vote, whatever it is, uh, you may... Uh, be struggling with this. I've heard uh, several people, you know, ask where God is in all of this. Uh, and uh, you may even ask yourself what God is thinking. Uh, and you have to remember, I mean, one thing that, that during this whole process that you you have to wonder, uh, you know, is God taking part? And I can assure you he is. Uh, one thing that God, one verse that God has impressed upon me this week uh, is in the chapter uh, Isaiah. Is chapter uh, 55 of Isaiah verses uh, 8 and 9 uh, that have really impacted me this week and I, I feel that's what the Lord is impressing upon me uh, anytime I think about the election or what our country is going through or why God would allow something uh, I'll go ahead and read that for you before we start it says uh, starting uh, again that's Isaiah chapter 55 uh, verses 8 and 9 it says uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Uh, and that just, it really impressed upon me, you know, the sense that I get God is in control, no matter whether or not I agree with, with what's going on, whether I agree with, with who was elected, whether I agree with the election process, how things were done. Uh, whatever it is, I believe that God is in control. Uh, and I have to understand that when I look to the Lord and, you know, I want to ask questions, uh, God, why are you doing this? God, how could you allow this? God, uh, do you not know? Uh, do you not know uh, about this guy's stance on such and such and such? Uh, do you not know? When I do that, I'm trying, I'm trying to instruct God. When you do that, you're trying to teach God. Who can teach God? Who can teach God? Uh, God is not falling down on duty. He's not being slack. Uh, we need to understand that his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. His ways are so much higher than our ways. We couldn't possibly comprehend it. I'm not entirely sure that we'll be able to comprehend that when we get to heaven. I mean, or with God and have him explain it to us. If God came down right now and explained this to me, I'm fully convinced that my head would explode. I can't, I can't comprehend it. It's too far beyond me. Uh, it's so far, it says the heavens are higher than the earth. Well, the heavens are way up there. That's how, that's how far our thoughts are separated from his thoughts. So, uh, take heart in that. Uh, that has brought me a lot of comfort this week. Uh, just sit back, man. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. And he doesn't need my help. God knows what he's doing. Doesn't need my help. Uh, so we'll go ahead and today we're going to again be in chapter 6 of uh, Romans uh, verses 7 through 11. I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, and then we'll come back a verse at a time. Uh, starting in uh, verse 7, it says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, this, uh, I mean, I, Thursday morning when I did my study, man, I really needed this lesson. Uh, I really needed the, my time in the Word. Uh, uh, and Preacher Leon mentioned something in the uh, the, the service just now. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, I, ne I needed my time in truth. Uh, this is truth. Uh, and you, we've spent so many, I mean, you can't turn on the TV now without a political ad. You can't pick up your phone without a political ad. You can't uh, do anything now. And 
all of these ads contradict each other. So somebody's lying. Okay. They all might be lying. I mean, how would we know? Uh, but I do enjoy picking up this book and studying this book and finding truth. Finding truth. There is no lie in here. This is the absolute truth. So if you're looking for it, here it is. Uh, we go back to verse 7. It says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Uh, and this is uh, this is something that every believer has. Okay, Through the believer's union with Christ, he's dead. He has died. Okay, He's freed from sin. He's freed from sin. This means that he's no longer under his dominion or control. Okay? Imagine uh imagine a man, for example, who is uh sentenced to death uh, for murdering someone. Okay? He's tried, he's convicted, he's sentenced. Okay? Uh his sentence is death. Okay? Uh, as soon as he dies, by whatever it is, uh, as soon as he takes his punishment. He's free from that sin. He's paid the penalty. Uh, freed uh, here, uh, Greek literally means justified. Okay, so when it says that he's literally, he's freed from the sin, the Greek literal translation there is he is justified from that sin. Now that he's paid the price for it, he's free from it. Okay. Uh, the only difference that, that we have as believers is that we died in Christ. We died in Christ. He stands in our place. He stood in our place. He stands in our place now. Uh, he takes our punishment on himself. Uh, he pays the penalty for our sin. And now that he's paid that penalty, the case against us, uh, the case that, that we didn't have a chance of winning, uh, the case against us now is closed. Uh, we died with Christ on the cross. Not only has the penalty for our sin been paid, but the stranglehold that sin has on our life, uh, that's broken now. That's broken now. The only place that sin has in my life now is the place that I give it. And that's true for you as well. If Christ lives within you, sin's not making you do anything that you didn't want to do. He's giving you the power. You are no longer uh, the helpless captive to sin that you once were. No longer. Uh, moving on to verse 8, it says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Uh, and this is, this is truth, man. I mean, this is one side of the truth. We died with Christ. That's one side of the truth. The other side of that truth is that if we shall also live with Christ, if we died with him, we're going to live with him. It's a if then. If this happened, then surely this is going to happen. I love that. I love the way Paul does that here. Uh, the context here suggests that Paul uh, not only means that believers will live in the presence of, of Christ uh, for all eternity, but also that all who have died with Christ, uh, and just to be clear, that is every believer. Every believer has died with Christ. Uh, that's all of us. All that have died with Christ will also live a life here and now that is empowered by Christ and is consistent with his holiness. Now, man, let me tell you something. That one stomped all over my feet this week. Uh, I mean, it's almost laughable. Would I consider, uh, would I, would I can, can I compare my life to the holiness of Christ? No. No, I mean, I, I, the, the thought makes me want to hang my head. The thought fills me with shame. Uh, but I need to understand that, that, that Christ is within me. And Christ has given me the strength and the power to become more and more like him every day. That should be my goal. To become, uh, to live a holier life today than I did yesterday. And the same thing tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. Uh, 
because Christ is with me. I think that's what what's Paul is suggesting here is that we have the power within us and we can call upon that and use it in our daily life. Uh, it's uh, not something we'll have then. I mean, obviously we're going to live with Christ for all eternity, but we've got that now, okay? Uh, we die to sin, okay? We need to live to righteousness. Sin's dominion over us is gone, okay? The, the dominion it had over us is shattered, okay? We share Christ's resurrection life here and now. And we need to make use of that. Okay? Uh, and we'll share that for all eternity. Praise God. Praise God. But we have to remember we've got it now, too. And we need to make use of it. In verse 9, it says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Uh, now, our confidence here is based in the fact that Christ will never die again. Well, you say, how can you say that? Uh, the confidence that I have in that is because he was seen uh, by people who knew him for a minimum of three years. People knew him for at least three years uh, of his ministry. These people saw him arise. Uh, they touched him. They felt him. They watched him eat. Uh, his mother saw him. Uh, his brother saw him. Uh, we know for certain that at least the 11 saw him rise into heaven. We know that. Uh, and these men, uh, these are men that tradition tells us never recanted. Not once. Uh, even to their dying breaths. And quite a few of them suffered very, very horrible deaths. Uh, Paul uh, was beheaded by Caesar. Uh, I believe it was Nero. Uh, Peter is another one that tradition tells us suffered a, a terrible death. He was crucified upside down. Uh, tradition uh, means that non-biblical writings, uh, so uh, Jewish writings and other non-biblical sources tell us that Peter was crucified upside down uh, at his own request uh, because he said he was not worthy to be crucified and to die in the same way that his Lord did. Uh, and he was crucified, uh, like I said, tradition tells us, after he was forced to watch his wife be crucified. Uh, so uh, they they never recanted. I mean, what they, they were dying. If they were lying, why would they not say so? Uh, why would they not tell us? They're going to take this to the grave. Uh, there's a saying that three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Uh, and that's pretty accurate. You're telling me, I mean... The, the naysayers and the skeptics tell me, you're telling me 11 men kept the secret? I mean, to torture, punishment, death, for, I mean, they all just, it was all a big conspiracy. They all just owned it. And, like, for what? That, that fully convinces me uh, that what they saw was true. He rose to heaven, okay? Uh, death no longer has any dominion over him. Uh, dominion means mastery. It means control. It means domination. Death, dom death had dominion over Christ for three days. That's what Christ allowed. He allowed death to have dominion over him for three days. Okay, uh, But it couldn't hold him. When he said it was enough, it was enough, and death had no power over Christ. Uh, and now that that happened, now that he raised, he was raised from the dead, death, uh, the dominion that death had over Christ is gone forever. It's forever past. Christ will never die again. That's the confidence that we had. In verse 10, it says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now, when Jesus died, he died to the whole subject of sin once and for all the end. Sin is done. The, the entire thought of sin is ended, okay? Uh, he died to all aspects of sin, okay? Sin's claims. Uh, he died to sin's wages. He died to sin's demands. He died to sin's penalty. He finished that for us, okay? 
he finished the work and settled the account so perfectly uh, that it never needed to be repeated. That's why I have a problem with the mass, uh, the mass, the Catholic mass. Uh, they say that they are literally pulling Christ down from heaven, crucifying him again, and you are literally eating his body and literally drinking his blood. Uh, I have an issue with that. This verse tells me right here that, that it's done. It's finished. Uh, he died for sin once and for all. Uh, once and for all. He doesn't have to do that again and again and again. He doesn't need a Catholic priest to pull him down out of heaven and, and sacrifice him all over again for new sins. It was once and for all. This verse tells me that. Okay? It doesn't need to be repeated. Uh, and now that he lives, he lives to God. Now, of course, there's, there's in one sense, obviously, uh, that he always lived to God. Uh, but now he lives to God in a new relationship uh, as the risen one as the spotless lamb sacrificed for us uh, in a new sphere where sin can never enter, okay? Because of this new relationship, we are seen by God as having died with Christ and having risen with him. And we discussed last week that baptism uh, is a picture of that. Uh, this relationship now is pictured in baptism. Christ's death and resurrection uh, on the cross is pictured in bath baptism. Our death with Christ ends uh, our lives as men and women in Adam. It's amazing. Uh, God's sentence on our old man uh, was death. God's sentence for sin was death. It was never reformation. And that's what we got. Okay. Uh, the sentence was death. Uh, that sentence was carried out and we we died in Christ. And we were made new. We were made new. We weren't reformed. We weren't straightened out. Now you're going to be a better person. The old man that I was is dead. What I am now is a new creation. I'm a new creation. And if you say that's that's too hard to understand. We're talking about the man that, that created the entire universe with a with a word. Boom. It was that quick. You think it making me somebody new or you somebody new is a difficulty for God? No. Not even close. Uh, now we're risen with Christ uh, to walk in a newness of life. I'm a new man. Why would that be hard? Uh it's hard because uh, we, we still live down here and we still uh, live in a fallen world and we're still encased in fallen, uh, sinful man. Uh, I'm basically trapped in a sinful flesh. Uh, but sin's tyranny over me uh, and over my life is finally broken, okay? Uh, because sin has nothing to say to a dead man. I'm dead. The only power that sin has over my life now is the power that I give sin that I give sin. Uh, and the same is true for you. Uh, now we are free to live for God. And we should. We should. Sin no longer controls my life. Sin only has the control that I allow it to have. Uh, and that's the, the same is true for you. Uh, you can't say the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do it. Uh, the, de the devil contends you, but he can't make you do anything. You belong to, to the Lord God. And stronger is he that's in you than he's in the world. He can't hold, he doesn't hold a candle to Christ. The devil can't make you do nothing you didn't want to do. Uh, you can say that when you're done and try to put the blame somewhere else. Uh, but the fault lies with you. Sin has no more power over me than I let it have. Uh, and I'm ashamed to say that every, you know, every now and then I, I let it in. Uh, daily, I, you know, when I sin, it's not the devil's fault. It's my fault. I did. Uh, and you got to own that. You got to own that. Um, in verse 11, it says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul, in verses 1 through 10 here, Paul has been describing us positionally. Okay? Uh, and now he is going to turn to the practical outworking 
of this truth in our daily lives. We are to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And reckon here means uh, to accept what God says as truth and live in the light of it. Okay? Uh, I've come across a quote there in my study that, that summed this up well. It was a quote from uh, Ruth Paxson's, uh, something that she wrote. It says, it means, uh, and this is uh, quoting Ruth Paxson, it says, it means believing what God says in Romans 6, 6, and knowing it as a fact in one's own personal salvation. This demands a definite act of faith which results in a fixed attitude towards the old man. We will see him where God sees him, on the cross, put to death with Christ. Faith will operate continuously to keep him where grace placed him. This involves us very deeply, for it means that our hearty consent has been given to God's condemnation of and judgment upon that old I as altogether unworthy to live and as wholly stripped of any further claims upon us. The first step in a walk of practical holiness is this rec uh, reckoning upon the crucifixion of the old man. And that's pretty good. Uh, that touched me this week because basically what she's saying is the first the first step here for me in having a uh, in a, a practical walk of holiness in my own life is fully agreeing that the old man that I was uh, was fully deserving of death. He was fully deserving of God's condemnation and judgment uh, and was unworthy to live. He was unworthy to live uh, and unworthy to have any claims upon me anymore. Uh, what she's saying is that we have to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Uh, and when we respond to temptation as a dead man would, you can't tempt a dead man. A dead man doesn't respond. Okay. Uh, tradition tells us that one day Augustine was accosted by a woman who had been his mistress uh, before his conversion, uh, when he turned, he, he, when she started calling out to him, he turned and walked away quickly. Uh, now, when he did that, she called after him, Augustine, Augustine, it's me, it's me. He quickened his pace and he turned over his shoulder and called back over his shoulder to her and said, yes, I know, but it's no longer me. And I, lo I love that. I love that. Uh, talk about temptation. Temptation came calling on this man. This was a, uh, a woman that, that he had obviously had a, uh, a relationship with. Uh, he shared fornication with this woman. Uh, and she meets him in, a, uh, in the marketplace one day and calls out to him. Uh, if that's not temptation knocking on your door, I don't know what is. Uh, what he was trying to say uh, to her and what he was trying to get her to understand he was dead to that life. He's like, no, I know it's you. I know who you are. I remember who you are. What you don't understand is that I'm no longer who you remember. Okay? The, the, the guy you knew, he's dead. I'm new. I'm a new creation. The guy that, that you remember, the guy that, that, that you slept with, the guy that you had a... Uh, uh, a relationship with he's dead now you don't know him and lest I get caught up in that what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and run I'm going to turn around and run uh, and you, you may say that's not very manly uh, and I've actually been asked this question before because men, there's a different relationship uh, between this uh, with men than there is with women uh, because you know, a woman can, she can do that pretty much whenever she decides she wants to, uh, no, uh, it's not the same for a man. 
Uh, I've actually had Frank ask me this question. He says, what do you do if a girl walks into your office and she just starts taking off her clothes? I said, man, I said, I'm going to pray that the Lord gives me the strength to run as fast as I've ever run in my life. Uh, and he laughs at me. Uh, you run from a little girl? You, yes, yes, I will run from a little girl. I am going to take off running like somebody, like the devil is chasing me. I am going to take off running like the devil is chasing me. She can ha have the office. All yours. Uh, and I'm going to be calling my wife on the way. Get over here, baby. I need you. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's what he knew. That's what he knew. He, he knew that, that his old self was, he was dead to this is what Augustine was saying. I'm dead to that life. I can't, I can't be the person that you want me to be anymore. I'm a new creation now. The relationship we had, the relationship with the man you had, the man you had that relationship with, he's dead. He's dead. And that's how he responded to that temptation. To that temptation. Uh, a dead man has, has nothing to do with immorality. A dead man has nothing to do with lying. A dead man doesn't have anything to do with cheating, adultery, fornication, uh, or any other sin. Any other sin. The same should be true of you and me. Uh, we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. This means that we are called to holiness. This means that we are called to worship. This means that we are called to prayer. This means that we're called to service. Uh, and this also means that you're called to fruit bearing. Uh, if you're a productive member uh, and you're saved and you belong to Christ, you should bear fruit. Uh, and I had somebody in my class this morning say, well, you'll never know if you're, if you're producing fruit or not. And uh, that may be true. That may be true. But I can guarantee you, you'll know if you're not producing anything. Uh, and it's all about effort. If you're not doing anything for, for the Lord, I guarantee you know you're not producing any fruit. Uh, and this steps on my toes as well. Uh, you have to ask yourself this. Are you, are you living up to this? Uh, when was the last time that you brought Christ into a conversation? When was the last time? Because it's not politically correct right now, uh, especially with uh, the, the politics in our country right now. I mean, we're looking to take God out of stuff. Uh, we talk about a, a candidate talked about their faith uh, while taking uh, God out of the what was it the national uh, or the pledge of allegiance that was what it was talked about his faith and removed God from our pledge of allegiance hmm you got to be careful with that because that word right now is thrown around all kinds of ways uh People are going to tell you about, oh, I love their faith. Oh, I love his faith. Oh, I love this faith. I don't care anything about any of that stuff. I don't want to know about his faith. I want to know about his relationship to the faith. I want to know about his relationship and his faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Where do you stand on that? Uh, and you have to, you've got to, you've got to know uh, you've got to bring this up. It's not politically uh, correct right now to bring up Christ, to bring up God, to talk about that, everybody's decision. Uh, but this is what we're called to do. You're called to bear fruit. You're called to bring the gospel. Who would you rather please? Your neighbor? Or the Lord? Uh, and you may say, you know, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Well, nobody wants to offend anybody, but you got to be careful that you don't not offend that person right into hell. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's the truth. I mean, if you're you tiptoe around that person, you're going to not offend him right into hell. Uh, and that's that's one thing that that has has tormented me. I worry that that when I stand before the Lord, the Lord is going to show me the people He sent me to talk to, and I didn't. And he's going to show me a slideshow of faces of people that are in hell now because I didn't preach to them. I didn't share the gospel with them. 
and that weighs on me. We'll end there today. Uh, we're going to pick up next week in verse uh, 12 in Romans. Uh, and, you know, let me just leave you with this. Uh, it's from our lesson. I mean, I know we're in a, in a trying time right now politically in our country, but I'm telling you, God's got this. God is in control. Uh, God is always in control. My God is big enough to handle this. Okay. Uh, and regardless of what you think or how you think it should have happened, when you when you call out and be like, yeah, hey, what is he thinking? What you're saying is that, that you would like to explain something to God. Uh, and who needs to teach God? Certainly not me. Certainly not me. Trust and, and have faith that he's got all of this under control. Whether I can understand it or not, he's got it all under control. He's got this. And he don't need my help. Doesn't need yours either. Uh, we'll close in prayer. Please come back next week uh, and be with us again uh, as we pick up in verse 12 of, of chapter 6 in Romans. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for everything you've given us, uh, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house this morning uh, after a, a trying week, Lord, uh, to worship you, Father, uh, to find to find real truth. You wouldn't uh, think that that would be uh, so hard, Father, but in our, in our lives today, uh, you know, the truth is, is twisted to, to fit whatever it is or whatever they're trying to sell us, Lord. Uh, we thank you that we can come to your word and, and see living truth, Father. We praise you for that. We ask that you be with our country during this trying time, Father. Uh, we ask that you be with us uh, and give us peace uh, regarding this, Lord, so we can know that, that you've got all of this under control. You always have. We're new to the game, Lord. You've been here. You've got just as much control today as you did 2,000 years ago, as you did 4,000 years ago, Father. You're, you're always in control, Lord, regardless of whether or not we can understand what's happening. We praise you for being the God that you are. We praise you for being that kind of God. We ask that during the week, Father, that, that you'll grant us peace and that you'll, you'll grant us the opportunity to, to take your word out into the world, Father, to take your truth out into a world that, that doesn't know what truth is anymore. They wouldn't know the truth from a lie now, Father. We thank you for, for the opportunity to take your truth into the world. We ask that you give us the words and, and give us people that don't know the truth, Father, uh, and give us the opportunity to plant seeds in their lives, Father, to water seeds that are already there, to fertilize, Father, and we praise you in advance for the growth that we will, you will give to that, Lord. We know that growth belongs to you and you alone, Father, and we praise you for that. We ask that you be with us throughout the coming week. Keep us safe uh, until we're able to come back to your house, Father, and fellowship again with one another, uh, studying truth, your truth, your word, Lord. All these things we ask, in the name of all other names, Jesus, Lord. Amen. Thank you.